Hello, I'm Morris Kohansky, Wilderness Living Skills and Survival Instructor. Uh, I might also add elderly about it. Uh, today's project is going to be making a simple knife. Now knives have played a big role in my um, living because I was an outdoor educator, survival instructor, and if there's anything that you need in the, uh, in the bush is a knife. Well, the situation was it took years to develop an opinion as to what the desirable qualities of a knife would be. And initially I was Tom Rudcroft's understudy and I started off with the right foot by learning as much as what he knew about knives or, or, or his opinion about knives. Now probably in the late 60s, probably something like 1960 eight or 69, I ended up working uh, at the survival school to replace someone who had suddenly left the picture. And uh, uh, Tom and I worked together because he was the head senior survival, civilian survival instructor there. Now we had a problem with the programs that the uh, military guys that showed up were issued a knife and reissued it. That is, at the beginning of the course, they were given the knife. At the end of the course, they turned it back in. And, it, and that knife, by the time it went through a few cycles, would take hours to put an edge on it because it would have been so abused and dull. And there's no way that you could do the type of, uh, of work uh, that uh, you needed to do, like feathering wood and cutting down sticks and making traps and deadfalls and stuff and so on. Uh, when we say what is an objective for knife skills or knife uh, property, if your knife can't carve a netting needle and a shuttle like this readily, well there's a big chunk of the picture that is unavailable to you. So I would say the proof of a suitable knife to use in wilderness survival in the bush is, is uh, one that will carve a netting needle and shuttle probably give you be fair about it and give you 10 minutes to accomplish this mini type of task. Although you may never really get around to using net and so on in survival. But basically the, the delicacy of, of um, uh, operating is, uh, is exemplified by netting needle and shuttle. Well after some discussion with Tom, this was probably the knife that we came up with as had the, the kind of universal neither this, neither that. That is a blade that is about four fingers long, handle that fits well into the hand and gives you the control as to the direction that the cutting edge is going to go. The blade itself has got a continuous curvature for its full length. There is no waste of space between where the grip ends and the cutting edge begins. And uh, the knife has got a tip configuration that will allow you to make holes because in the wilderness you make holes that are squarish or rectangular rather than round. You don't make much of a hole using a knife tip and rotating it like this through which you could string anything. At any rate, so here you're looking at as an example of a knife that incorporated most of the desirable features except one. Uh, and that feature might be um, that it's unbreakable. The blade here is flexible because it comes from this steel. You'll notice this is a uh, got enormous teeth. This was once a big loop that was probably 15. The rest of the loop is over there, about 15 or, or three meters in diameter, and it was a bandsaw from a commercial uh, a mill that would cut logs, hog size logs, and so on. And when something would happen to these blades, which was pretty common, they were just discarded because they could not be re refurbished or put back into operation. And so if you found an old mill site, sawmill site up in the Hinton area at any rate, and you poke around, you're likely going to find a pile of these somewhere or other. And very common. And uh, generally Tom had learned that the local native people and so on, when they needed to make knives, they exploited the steel in this. You notice here that that uh, there is a bit of bend to that, which could 
come back to bother us a little bit. And the length and the width of the blade is such that uh, you need to cut it at an angle because you don't have enough metal otherwise to be able to attach the handle and so on. And this is fairly springy, but it has its limit of elasticity. And we could demonstrate that a little bit in the sense that here we have a piece and the way you extract it is you bend it, step on it, and when you jump on it, it'll break. And of course, you want to make sure that you don't uh, let the spring rip your crotch out or something. So I'm going to show you the limit of its elasticity, which means that as we keep bending it, and the bend will, will eventually. And I've got that trapped, and now if I go like this and I keep doing this, it'll eventually snap. There we go. So you can see that this metal, perhaps if it was young, wasn't all corroded, it wouldn't be so brittle. You wouldn't be able to do that. And of course, in the piece that you want, if, you're, if you really want to uh, avoid the problems with any type of bend or kink, you pick pieces that are a little straighter. I have been working on this piece here. And you'll find the challenge is that the steel can be so hard that um, it would be difficult to cut with a hacksaw. But it's not that difficult to cut with a cold chisel and a good vise. So I'm going to, the big problem is the vise has only got so much throat to it. Uh, I have to trim this edge up a little bit because the, uh, I was a little bit out of practice since uh, a week ago or so. I tried my hand at this again, trying to remember everything I did from the, from the 60s because I haven't really done this since then. Okay, we will make a cut and we will try to uh, save time by taking an advantage of, uh, of the... Uh, you got to have a line to work to. Um, so I put that line down on the... Now if your chisel is ground and freshly sharpened, which this is, uh, microscopically what we're trying to do in the vise, we've clamped our metal and then the, the little facet of the, of the chisel has to sort of ride in contact with the top and it's got to be right at where the, the um, vise is, is holding the metal. And you'll find that the cutting goes fairly, fairly easily, actually. Well, being from this view, I should maybe work it this way. The, uh, the more careful you are in making your cut, the less time you spend at the grinding wheel. And so here we put our chisel, and you'll notice the chisel has to be this little flat spot Right there, it has to be riding flat, like it can't be up off of that. It's got to be right at that, at that point where the, the um, and you got to make sure that your vice is holding. The, and with a little bit of an angle, you'll find light taps will often do the job. And it would help if I put my glasses on so I can actually see what I'm doing rather than going by feel. With a little bit of practice you can do a pretty clean job. Uh, as I say, getting around the need to grind a, a rough cut. Now my vise has only going, gone so far, so I've got to shift this over to complete my, my cut.
when we were making the knives, we could make three an hour. And if my jaw, the vise here has got corrugated teeth for better grip, so as a result, it's almost a little bit like a saw edge that we've created. But there we have more or less extracted the blank. And as I say, with practice, by the time you do a dozen, which I haven't, you would be cutting these almost to their desired shape. And here I'll exploit what I have here, and I will grind it to the profile that I like. Of course, in the old, old days, I was the motive power for my father's grinding, because the grinding wheel had to be cranked by someone, and kids can do that. I'm wearing glasses, but it's, um, it's nice to wear glasses to protect your eyes. So hard to replace an eye once you have a little bit of metal go through your eyeball. the profile roughly and I'm going to have to cut some of this off something that I don't want uh, I might leave myself four fingers and that from that point I need a, a hand and the way we attach the handle is dozens of ways but I think that if I cut it off now there's one way of using an angle like like this and using one rivet but that's such a touchy situation it's uh, faster to make two holes uh, and then keep the blade in place because two holes will hold it. So back to the cold chisel for a moment. Get these out from underfoot so I don't mark my shins. All right. I'm going to. Well, let's not get too carried away here. Because the metal is so thin, it grinds away. Um, you can see that it's of a nature that if you force it, you can put a permanent bend in. So we have the... Uh, over here, we might save a little grinding, since you can see that using the chisel and the vise is actually pretty fast. The uh, handle might come into play at this point. We'll talk about handles in a short while, but I'm going to compare my, my handle to how much I want to take off. On the, and I want that to be slightly narrower. And since I did such a Mm 
this with each time I do this I get that much better. bit less to grind. So as, as springy and stiff as this metal is, it's remarkable that using the cold chisel it's almost as, as good as using a can opener. So I have roughed this out now I'm going to try to make a nice job of it. Um, this knife here, maybe the tip was a little not as pointy as I would have liked. <coughs> but the uh, the the first thing is functionality, elegance comes second. One more grind and we'll be able to put the handle on. to let it cool a little bit and I should wear gloves and then I could handle it to a certain heat and I think I'll regularize it a little bit. I want continuous curvature and there are many profiles. The, uh, the uh, one knife uh, played a bit of a role in the profile determination for the skookum. And you can see that there's um, uh, the bulge starts at the tip and uh, it's kind of more of a pointy type. This one here is more of a blunt, but then this goes back 40 years or so. Now we're going to make holes for putting the pins through. And the uh, way here is that you have to have something, well, maybe use a washer or something where you can make a dimple. And we need a, a center punch. I hope I haven't lost, mislaid it is a, a blunt point instead of a blunt chisel. And you pick the place where you want the rivet to go, which is maybe definitely close to the end of the strip of metal, and you dimple it. And you grind the dimple away. And you keep doing that till you have the hole that you, you want. A really good dimple. Yep. This spring steel would be kind of difficult to drill through, you, although you, you can acquire drills that would go through, but uh, basically the, uh, I'll be able to work on the dimples and I'll uh, work on the profile some more. You grind off the rough side of the dimple.
then pull it again from the opposite side. And the hole should be big enough for the pins to go through. Nice blade is more or less roughed out. Now you can put the handle on and um, then sharpen it after the handle has been put on. And we'll go to the grinding wheel once again and, and tidy it up. I've got continuous curvature. It might be uh, not as elegant as I would like, but that's uh, what we're after. The width narrower than my handle so that they won't bother my hand. This is a hockey stick handle. If you're going to pack useful items in a survival kit, hockey stick handles might just be the thing. I'm going to give it one more little grind here and then we'll look at making a handle. Tom Rockar said that when you're packing a survival kit, surely you'll have to include some coat hangers, some paper clips, a minimum of two bags of marshmallows, and go to a hockey rink and retrieve a couple of broken hockey stick handles. <laughs> He figured that you'd make a superior kit in those days because of the sort of lack of thought and experience that was put into survival kits in those days. But, uh, there you've got the resources. I pick on hockey stick handles because they're ready-made. We, we used to use uh, axe handles. You can see that if you save a broken handle, whether it's a hammer or a hatchet or axe, that uh, there are parts of the handle that are ready-made in shape. So here I have two nice handles uh, out of that and so you get so much more mileage. Or if you're more into the oval shape, there might be a part that you cut out here. But I've chosen to mass produce my handles and here I have the whole hockey stick handle that has been sort of maybe plane down a little bit with a hand plane, sanded smooth. So all I have to do is cut these. And this rectangular handle, believe it or not, if you put it into the normal hand and the way the fingers form rectangles there, when you set it up, you might have a grasp on your handle that's uh, much more effective than um, the conventional type of oval type handles. Now here I'm gripping my handle. I'm going to look at where my blade will go and I want to make sure that the handle is not too short. Just a, a, a tad longer. So I've realized that we can use that about there.
the survival usages of the marshmallows are considerable. Like, for example, you could put these inside your shirt or jacket, and you have a personal flotation device that will allow you to stay afloat. No one uses saws like this anymore. And of course, if you were mass producing all of this, you would uh, have a, I've got a razor rifle sitting there, but by the time you set everything and get things going, here we stay in the focus of the camera. Yeah, we look at our handle four fingers or less maybe we can see that this has to go all the way down to here. You could conserve on metal and make that considerably shorter but today we, well, we're not um, if you're mass producing these with electricity a great deal and that's another story. On the bandsaw, this would take seconds. This, of course, is now a, a crosscut <laughs> used as a rip, just a little bit slower. But I'm not going to switch saws just yet. Just go fast. We could have two pieces. This is easier to match, but if you didn't have a saw to cut like this, you could just uh, you could use antlers. except for the rivets. Put it on for see how it fits. the handle, there's the blade, and we, since we have it there, we mark it. And we have many different ways of attaching this. It's already in there, tough enough, but since I marked it, I put it here and I now know where the holes will go if I want to drill them elsewhere. Now if you have a, a drill that would go through that metal, you would just go through everything at once. Or one way to do this 
is to hold your blade on there like that and drill the holes through and then you'll be precisely where you where you want it to be. I do have a drill bit all set up. Here is a certain element of hazard when you got a blade and you're drilling through. It's apt to whip around when it catches on the drill bit. So hold on to it really firmly. Loosely it's apt to fly around and cut your knuckles off. Here we can put on a glove. And now we could. Drilling through the blade and the handle at the same time. The, uh, any irregularities The blade protrudes, of course, the grinder will take care of that. Now a smart person would rivet that one hole and then drill this hole. Because things shift and then the holes might not match up. So, so let's sort of do a temporary job here. Rivets are the right, you can buy pup rivets everywhere, but you can't buy the old fashioned rivets. I have a copper rivets that I have on this knife, which were commonly available in the stores, in the hardware stores that cater to farmer's needs. And uh, that's a thing of the past. I found it maybe in Edmonton, but not here. So by putting a, a pin in here, I have it. aluminum nails that almost look like rivets. So, there, by putting this one in. The other hole will be exactly where I want it. Hmm. We have gone to the point where we have put the blade onto the handle. We have managed to drill through the handle to put the rivets in. And we have a lot of extra in these uh, uh, if we can hold on to our we have the extra lengths here so we gotta nip those off. We don't want to nip it too short, so there's a little bit of peening that can be done. And uh, the knife will be ready for sharpening. Oops. The washers don't want to stay.
the only malleable stuff I can find readily for putting the handles on are aluminum nails. And we have just about got that. How many times are we going to drop the washer? And we have a hammer that's rounded on the back. That's called a ball peen hammer. And with that we we work the the head to There we go again. The washers are, should be driven on to a tight fit. And we have, now we need to press that down to smooth it a bit. This is to make the handle smoother than that. Now we have the handle on and the blade on, but all has now the sharpening has to be done on the cutting edge and the finishing of the handle, which is usually done with a belt sander of some sort. Now, if you don't have one of these, you usually have a portable belt sander, but you'd have to turn it upside down. And since we have this, we now will um, use it. Do a little work on that. various parts of the handle and I find that belts good for wood working wood are also not too bad for working metal especially if they're worn out as I work on this I'm visualizing maybe 225 cent pieces at the back of my blade as being my my angle.
you can attest to the, the steel, it takes a little bit of effort, especially this, this belt here, I could have uh, ch changed it for a fresh one and uh, done a faster job. I should have had a, uh, the, the main grinding down. I still have a moment or two, a minute or so left here yet. Now I've been grinding on both sides and at a certain point where I figure I'm getting close to the edge I grind on one side till I see the burr. There's quite a grab burr that's turned over and I now know that I've uh, 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 pretty well ground it to the, the, the point where both sides have come in. And now I lightly uh, do both sides. And now at this point, I would say we have a functional edge, but uh, we'll review the sharpening process because there's still a fine burr, and I can probably even do justice to the burr with a steel. Four fingers for the blade, handle a little bit longer than the hand, handle made of, uh, of a rectangular configuration or perhaps tapered, on the sides that can come later and when you grip it you've got a good firm grip so that you can use that firm grip to control the moving edge of the blade and theoretically I should if I really got rolling I figure I could probably create three of these an hour particularly appropriate to outdoor education and we're not trying to take work away from knife makers but basically this is about as fundamental as it can get and yet uh, be very useful very functional and be very light so you can appreciate we could just include this blade in a kit and the bulk of the handle you put it on when you need it that sort of thing but I would say that to me this comes closer to being called a survival knife than many, many knives I've seen depicted in the literature.